perfect. Okay. Um, well, I suppose just a, a quick um, uh, welcome to everyone and um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Sam Ingwell and I'm just going to give a quick uh, introduction to Thomas Aubrey. Um, and a welcome to Thomas Aubrey as well. Thank you for um, coming to give this presentation for us this afternoon. Um, so Thomas is a Marie Curie Fel Fellow at the University of Cambridge and his background is in the numerical modelling of eruption um, volcanic eruption columns and how volcanic emissions get up into the atmosphere. And he combines this uh, numerical modeling with numerical modeling of atmospheric processes as well to look at the interplay between volcanic eruption processes and volcanic eruption emissions and, and climate. And so over the past couple of presentations of the past couple of months, um, there have been presentations looking at the measurement and monitoring of um, the sulfate emission from, from volcanoes um, and their transportation. And so today we're, um, Thomas is going to give us a little bit of a different idea about um, sulfates and um, sulfur emissions from volcanoes, looking at how um, uh, climate change is impacting or it will impact the stratospheric volcanic sulfate aerosol life cycle. So over to you, Thomas. Okay, thank you, Sam, for the introduction and uh, thanks, Chris, for organizing and thank you, all of you, for being here. Uh, so, yeah, the only thing I would add to uh, what Sam said is that my pronouns are uh, he, him. Uh, and then obviously I did this work with uh, many collaborators, which I would like to acknowledge. And uh, they are listed here. And in particular, Anya Schmidt, who is my um, postdoc fellowship mentor and host. Uh, and Simon Tang, with who I'm coordinating the IVSPAR working group, uh, which I will talk about at the end of this talk. Uh, and I would also like to acknowledge some of my funders, in particular the Royal Society and the European Union, and that's particularly important because I'm asking money to uh, all of them at the moment. Um, and so today, as Sam said, I'm going to talk about the impact of uh, climate change on stratospheric volcanic sulfate aerosol, uh, and in turn their radiative forcing and climate. Uh, effect. Uh, just a tiny bit more about my background. So I did my uh, master research project uh, in Paris with Miriam Caudry on the impact of the Mount Pinatubo eruption on climate. Uh, I then moved to Vancouver in British Columbia to work on volcanic plume dynamics and how it would be affected by climate change, so quite the opposite question, uh, and also to paddle with forecasts, which was actually my main motivation to move there. And then I went back to uh, Europe, or what was the Europe, uh, in Cambridge for my postdoc fellowship, where I've been working on climate volcano interact interaction uh, and volcanic aerosol. And no hawkers in Cambridge, but if you visit, we have a, a lot of uh, cute cows. Um, so just setting the motivation for this talk. So the, the primary motivation is that volcanic stratospheric sulfate aerosol uh, affect climate. They uh, decrease the atmospheric transparency and exert a global mean surface cooling. So the way this works uh, is volcanic plume inject sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. And something really important it was that they injected uh, in the stratosphere above the tropopause or in the troposphere. Because in the troposphere, aerosol get washed out by precipitation within a matter of weeks, whereas in the stratosphere, they last for uh, up to a few years. So this sulfur dioxide gets converted into aerosol, like I said, and then they are dispersed globally and interact with both sun and earth radiation. Uh, and one of the main interactions we're concerned about is the backscattering of shortwave radiation, which uh, reduces the amount of sunlight we get at the surface and in turn induce uh, surface cooling, as well as other impacts such as on precipitation or key mode of uh, climate variability, such as the amino oscillation. Um, and to give a bit more context, this is the global mean stratospheric aerosol optical depth, or SAUD, over the last 40 years. Uh, and each of this peak that you see here is uh, a volcanic eruption. Uh, and in particular, the two major peaks that you see are El Chichon in 1982 and Pinatubo in 1991. Uh, and this injected on the order of 10 teragram of SO2 into the stratosphere. And I'm going to refer to such eruption as large magnitude volcanic eruption for the talk. And in the last 20 years, we had a lot of uh, volcanic activity from what I would refer to as moderate magnitude uh, volcanic eruption, 
and this injected on the order of 0.1 to 1 teragram of SO2 into the stratosphere. Um, and then that's kind of the forcing component. If we look at the temperature response, uh, this is a figure from the latest IPCC uh, report. Uh, and it shows the influence of on global mean surface temperature of different forcing factor. Uh, and here I want to highlight the green curve at the bottom in negative value, which is the uh, volcanic uh, uh, impact. And then the thick uh, black dashed line is the anthropogenic contribution. And you can see that actually some volcanically induced temperature anomalies are on the same order of magnitude as global warming driven by anthropogenic emission on multi-decadal timescales. So it's really a key forcing. But then of course, it's a short-lived forcing. So on average, uh, over uh, decades, the uh, anthropogenic forcing did the trend. The main message is that volcanic eruption are uh, actually one of the main driver of climate viability at annual to decadal uh, timescales. Um, so that's, that's what motivates uh, my talk, but the research question I'm interested in is the opposite question, is how climate change could affect volcanic forcing, and then uh, with the uh, idea being that maybe there are vol climate volcano feedbacks at play. If I come back to my schematics, I just want to start by highlighting it's not a new question. And in particular, we've known for decades that deglaciation cycle affect the uh, frequency and magnitude of volcanic eruption, uh, as well as uh, intense precipitation event. So the question is not new, but uh, strangely, atmospheric volcanic process uh, have really been underexplored until now. And I say strangely because they take place directly in the atmosphere, so one could think that they are particularly sensitive uh, to climate change. And in part here, I'm going to talk about how volcanic plume cream dynamics could be affected by climate change today. And that's a question I've explored a bit during my PhD. Uh, and uh, more uh, novel aspect of this talk is how the full aerosol light cycle could be affected by climate change, for example, change in atmospheric circulation or uh, temperature. Uh, so this is the outline of the talk. Uh, you've made it through the background and motivation. Uh, so congrats on that. I'm going to describe the methodology I will use, and then I will discuss the impact of climate change on two types of eruption, a moderate magnitude tropical eruption and a large magnitude tropical eruption. Uh, and I will give you some takeaway messages for uh, this part of the talk, impact of climate change on eruption. And then I will have a last part as a bit of an aside, uh, just discussing validation efforts of the numerical model I will use throughout the talk um, and with a particular focus on volcanic model. Okay, so I'm back again uh, to my schematic. So in this talk, I'm gonna use two types of model. The first type of model is what's called a one-dimensional volcanic plume model. And it takes two inputs, the mass eruption rate or MER, which is the flux of volcanic material through the vent, as well as atmospheric profile at uh, the volcano location, like temperature, wind speed, uh, and so on. And then the main output is the plume height, which is the height at which we assume that uh, sulfur dioxide is injected. And then the second type of model I will use is an aerosol chemistry climate model. So I will use the UK1, UK system model. And this one has two uh, key inputs, many inputs, but I will uh, only describe two ones. Uh, climate forcing such as uh, sun uh, radiation or CO2 emission from anthropogenic and natural sources. And then of particular in interest to this talk is the SO2, volcanic SO2 injection, for which we need the mass of SO2 injected, but also the location of injection and the height of injection. And then I'm going to combine these two models in the following way. The climate model is going to provide uh, the atmospheric profile required by the plume model to run. Uh, so at the time of the eruption, what is the simulated temperature profile at the volcano and wind profile and so on. And then in turn, the plume model is going to run and provide the sulfur dioxide injection height to the climate model, which will then calculate the full aerosol cycle um, and the temperature uh, radiative forcing and temperature response. Um, and this is the experimental design I will use. So all the simulation I will show are three-year-long simulation of a volcanic eruption that occur at the location of Mount Pinatubo. So we're at 15 degrees north uh, in the tropic. And I will discuss two different climate scenarios, uh, 
scenario corresponding to the 1990 to 2000 climate, which I may refer to as present day scenario. I know it's two decades ago, but uh, it's essentially my reference scenario. And then one scenario at the end of this century uh, under the what's called the SSP5 8.5 scenario, and that's the upper greenhouse gas emission trajectory used in the latest IPCC report. And now I'm going to look at two different uh, eruption case scenarios, one moderate magnitude eruption injecting one teragram of sulfur dioxide and with a mass eruption rate MER of uh, 10 to the 7 kilogram per second. And then that's representative of the moderate magnitude eruption we've had over the last two decades. And then a large magnitude eruption scenario, which is essentially the same, but upped by uh, one order of magnitude. And that's more representative of eruptions like Mount Pinatubo in 1991. And then for each combination of climate scenario and urgent scenario, I'm actually running 10 different simulations with different initial condition. And that's just to account for uh, uncertainty related to meteorological condition. Okay, so first I will talk to you about what goes into the plume model and the plume height uh, prediction that it's doing. So here I'm showing you the temperature profile inputted in the plume model, the blue curve is uh, for the historical climate and the red curve is the future warm climate uh, scenario. So you can see temperature decreasing in the troposphere and then uh, starting to increase in the stratosphere with the tropopause being the inflection point. And if you look at the difference between the two curves, of course, you see the troposphere uh, temperature increasing as you go from the reference climate to the future climate and vice versa in the stratosphere. And you also see the height of the inflection point of so the tropopause height uh, increase between the two climates. Um, and then something else important to notice is that the temperature difference between the two profiles is depending on the altitude. So that means the temperature gradient is changing and in turn the density stratification. Now, if we look at the density stratification, that is the Bundweiser frequency, you can see that it is increasing in the troposphere, but decreasing in the stratosphere. So what does it mean in terms of plume modeling and volcanic plume rise? So this is the corresponding uh, volcanic plume height predicted by the 1D plume model as a function of the mass eruption rate, so just the eruption intensity. And you can see that in the troposphere, plume height are decreasing, which is essentially driven by that increase in stratification and the opposite holds uh, in the stratosphere. And then the dashed horizontal line here, I like the troposphere height, which is also increasing. And then my two eruption case study are highlighted by the vertical dash line. So first the moderate magnitude eruption, for which you can see that the plume height is kind of in this sweet spot where it doesn't change between the two climates. But because the tropopause height is increasing, uh, it means it's much harder for volcanic eruption to reach the tropopause uh, under future warm climate condition. Uh, I just want to say that we pick this injection height because many of the recent tropical eruption, uh, moderate one, have been observed to inject roughly at the tropopause level. Okay, so now still for the moderate magnitude eruption, when we use this injection height in the aerosol chemistry climate model, what is the resulting um, sulfate aerosol cycle and climate response? So what I'm showing here is the uh, sulfur concentration as simulated by the climate model for months one to months four uh, following the eruption. And I'm showing this as a function of altitude uh, and latitude. So you can see initially the eruption cloud is very concentrated and mostly in the tropics. Uh, the injection took place at 15 degree north and roughly 16 kilometer. And then the cloud slowly spread uh, towards high latitude and also the concentration uh, decrease uh, as a result of both the cloud spreading and also some aerosol being lost to the troposphere. Now that is for the historical reference climate. Uh, this is what happened in the future M1 climate. So you can see that uh, the aerosol concentration are much lower and essentially after three months, there is no uh, sulfur left in the stratosphere. I forgot to say that the dashed line here is showing the tropopause height and you can see indeed it is higher in the reference climate by roughly two kilometers. Uh, and so the aerosol were injected at tropopause height in this scenario, but two kilometers below uh, in the future climate scenario. Okay, so now what does it mean in terms of forcing or at least uh, stratospheric aerosol optical depth? So these are the uh, 
corresponding global mean time series for these two scenarios. Uh, blue is the future, uh, sorry, blue is the historical uh, climate and red is the future warm climate. The shading here show the uncertainty related to um, just different initial conditions. And bottom line, you can see the, the SAOD perturbation decreased by a factor uh, three to four in the future climate. So we expect a much smaller response uh, to this moderate magnitude tropical eruption in the future. And this could mean that uh, there will be a decrease in the stratosphere, stratospheric volcanic aerosol background and potentially the corresponding radiative forcing and surface cooling. So that was for moderate magnitude tropical eruption. Now I'm going to jump to uh, large magnitude uh, eruption. For large magnitude eruption, just a reminder that because of the decrease of the atmospheric stratification in the stratosphere, the plume height actually rises higher by roughly 1.5 kilometer. So that's the plume height going into the uh, climate model. Um, and I'm directly going to show you uh, the response in terms of stratospheric aerosol optical depth, uh, global mean again. Uh, but this time, instead of having just a reference climate scenario in blue and future climate scenario in warm, I also have a third scenario in orange, which is called SSP585HIH, and that stands for historical injection height. So in this HIH scenario, I run the climate model with uh, four things, in particular anthropogenic four things corresponding to the future warm scenario, but the plume height that I'm using is the one that would be consistent with a historical climate. And that means that when you compare the orange line, the H SSP5 HEI scenario, and the red line, the SSP585 scenario, you see the effect of this increase in plume height. OK, so now what is actually happening on this graph? You can see that for both the orange and the uh, uh, red scenario, so in the future climate, the peak SAOD increased by roughly 10%. But if you look at the difference, uh, there is a faster decay in the orange light. So simply when we do account for that increase in plume height, uh, the aerosol are longer lived and we predict a longer lasting forcing. But now you can see that both of them, uh, the SAUD increase regardless of change in plume height. So that means there are also other uh, processes, volcanic processes that are affected by climate change and result in a SAUD increase. So what are these processes? So to discuss that, I'm going to show you again how the aerosol spread um, uh, in these simulations. So here I'm showing you the colon concentration of sulfate aerosol as a function of latitude and time after the eruption. So again, we inject at non-zero and 15 degree north, which is there. And as time passes, you can see the aerosol spreading towards high latitude, mostly the northern hemisphere in these simulations, uh, and then the concentration slowly decaying. Uh, and then this is historical scenario and the two future scenario. And if you look carefully, you may see that the aerosol spreads toward um, higher latitude faster in the future scenario. But to fully convince you, uh, this line of plot is now showing you paired difference between the scenario. So for example, if you look at this plot in the middle, that's the future climate scenario minus the reference one. You see less aerosol in the tropics and more at high latitudes, which just show uh, aerosol indeed spreading faster to high latitude. And you see that pattern regardless of whether we account for change in plume height. Um, and you also see this faster spreading um, when we do not account for the change in plume height. So when you inject the volcanic plume a bit higher, uh, you actually end up in a slower branch of what's called the broad dobson circulation that's transporting the aerosol from the tropics to the extratropics. And what I haven't mentioned yet, actually kind of critical, is that as Earth warms, this broad dobson circulation is projected to accelerate, which is why we see this faster transport to high latitude. Okay, so now how does this faster transport affect volcanic aerosol? So first here, I'm showing you the total burden of stratospheric aerosol uh, over the globe. Um, and you can see that it is decaying much faster and has smaller values in the future climate scenario, but in particular when we do not account for plume height. And that's simply because stratospheric aerosol sink uh, at high latitude. So the faster you get uh, aerosol there, the faster you also lose aerosol. And so if you have less aerosol, intuitively you expect a lower climate uh, forcing. The second part of the story is that because aerosols don't reside for as long in the uh, tropics, 
they, the concentration also a bit diluted, and they coagulate less, and uh, they grow less in size. So now the right plot is showing the effective radius of the aerosol distribution. You can see that this radius is higher in the history cold, cold, cold up climate. Uh, and the critical thing here is that small aerosol are more efficient at scattering sunlight, and which could lead to think that there will actually be a higher forcing in the future climate where aerosol are smaller. Now, the big question is which one wins the bar fight? Is it the total aerosol mass or uh, the effective radius decreasing? So now I'm finally showing you the radiative forcing time theory, and uh, which is negative because some sunlight is backscattered. And you can see that for both the red and orange scenarios of the future climate, this radiative forcing is amplified. It's actually a really big or fairly big amplification by 30%. Uh, and then if you carefully look again at the difference between the orange and red line, you may see that the radiative forcing decay a bit faster in the SSP 585 HEI scenarios when we don't account for plume height uh, change. Okay, and very last, uh, the temperature response associated with this radiative forcing. So first I'm starting with stratospheric temperature. In the stratosphere, the aerosol are absorbing near infrared radiation. So they actually result in a warming of the stratosphere. And I'm showing you the global mean value of this warming uh, average for the first posterior year here, and year one to three on the right. And then again, blue is the reference climate and orange and red, the future climate. So you can see that uh, the warming is amplified uh, in the future warmer climate. And if you look at the difference between orange and red, it's even more amplified when we account for this increase in plume height. Um, and what is happening at the surface? So the surface is the opposite. We have less incoming radiation because of the aerosol, which means we have a global cooling, hence the negative temperature anomaly. Uh, and again, you can see that this cooling is amplified in the future planet and uh, lasts for longer, uh, so stronger signal average over three years when we do account for the increase in plume height. So some take-home message on climate volcano feedback. Uh, really, if there is one thing I would like you to retain is that uh, atmospheric volcanic processes such as plume right and aerosol cycle are sensitive to climate change. So they represent a pool of mechanism uh, for potential climate volcano feedbacks. And the details, we project an amplification of the forcing and temperature response for large magnitude tropical eruption, but we also predict the exact opposite for moderate magnitude tropical eruption. The key question we are now left with is what will be the net effect across all type of eruption, meaning is global warming going to amplify or dampen volcanic cooling? Uh, and then if you want more detail on this result, uh, they've been published recently in Nature Communications. So you can check out this paper. Um, just a quick outlook. So to answer this question, is global warming going to amplify or dampen volcanic cooling? Uh, one of the first things we have to do is also explore how climate volcano feedback would work for different types of eruption. For example, extratropical eruption or basaltic eruption, such as the one of Lackey in 1783. 1784. Um, then what I would like to do too is combine the feedbacks I've been discuss discussing on aerosol cycle with other type of feedback, for example, deglaciation affecting eruption uh, frequency, and really build a holistic view of how these climate volcano feedbacks are going to affect future volcanic forcing. Uh, and last, I will also look at the past and understand how such feedbacks have been contributing to past climate change. Uh, and just a bit more on this holistic view. Uh, don't try to understand this full graph, uh, but this is a figure from a prospective paper in preparation. So these figures were made by uh, Jamie Farquharson. Jamie, if you are here, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. Um, but essentially, each of these arrows is highlighting if a volcanic process could be uh, amplified or exacerbated by climate change if the arrow is pointing up or uh, dampened by climate change make global warming if the arrow is pointing down. You can see some of the mechanisms I've been talking about, for example, the stratospheric plume height increasing here, or the aerosol size decreasing. Um, here you can see the eruptive flux increasing uh, as first warm and deglaciation occur. And I'm only showing you two thirds of the figure, and you can see many processes I've not been talking about. 
So this is just to tell you that there are a lot of ways through which climate change could affect volcanic processes. And I think a lot of really interesting uh, research avenues. Um, and last, if climate change goes really bad, uh, one highly controversial option is whether we should de deploy uh, geoengineering uh, by actually injecting earth-type stratospheric aerosol um, and mimic the effect of volcanic eruption. So one question uh, we've been interested in recently, it's a study led by Johnny Stanton Sykes, who was a PhD in Cambridge, is how engineered aerosol and volcanic aerosol could interact. <laughs> and so what this graph is showing you is the total stratospheric aerosol burden as a function of the time after the eruption. And uh, the red line here, if you just focus on the continuous line, just ignore the dashed line, uh, the red line is in a future warm climate, the same I've been using SSP 58.5. And the black line is the same climate, but where we do deploy to engineering. And you can see the aerosol burden being smaller and decaying faster. That's just related again to uh, engineered aerosol and volcanic aerosol uh, combining, coagulating together. They get bigger and they uh, settle faster from the stratosphere into the troposphere, which is why you see this effect. And another interesting effect is that this sink is so efficient that uh, there is actually an overshoot and you end up with uh, less aerosol than you had before the eruption uh, in the stratosphere. Um, okay, so that's it for the part where I'm discussing climate volcano feedback. Uh, so if you want to take a breath, uh, now is a good time. Um, I've been using a lot of numerical models for the presentation to build hypotheses on how climate change would affect volcanic processes. So what I would like to do now is briefly discuss how reliable are these models. Of course, the answer will not be satisfying. The first type of model I've been using are aerosol chemistry climate model. Uh, and so this figure here is from a paper by Margot Klein et al and show you the predicted stratospheric aerosol optical depth for the Tambora 1815 eruption uh, by roughly eight different climate models that can uh, predict the aerosol cycle interactively. And all these models were provided with the same SO2 mass, the same uh, injection location, and the same injection height. And you can see that uh, there is a really large range in terms of SAD perturbation predicted. Uh, there's a difference by a factor of two to three between the lowest model and the highest one. So a lot of spread and uncertainties among this model. And then the second type of model I've been using are volcanic plumes model. Um, and again, I'm showing you an experiment where all the volcanic plume model have been prescribed with the same source conditions, so in that case, the mass friction rate. And this graph is showing you the different plume height predicted by all of these individual models, which are just labeled at the bottom. And same picture, you can see widely different plume height prediction ranging from 35 kilometer up to 50 kilometer. So a lot of uncertainty uh, here too. The first thing I want to highlight though, is that because these models have different prediction in terms of absolute forcing or absolute plume height, doesn't mean that they would not agree on how climate change uh, would affect volcanic processes. So as an example, I've been looking at how uh, this model highlighted here and this one, so volcanic plume model. Uh, I've been comparing their response in terms of plume height to changing climate. And even though their absolute prediction are different, they both agree that uh, stratospheric plume height will increase and that a higher eruption intensity will be required for, uh, for stratospheric induction. Sorry. So even though this uncertainty are, of course, a source of concern, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that model will not agree on the trend in terms of how climate change will affect volcanic forcing and processes. Uh, that being said, we still want to be sure that, you know, try to infer which model are the best uh, and reduce this discrepancy. And a good place to uh, start getting information about that are what's called model intercomparison project. So what this table here is showing you is uh, the first column is a modeling community. The second column is a reference paper for the corresponding model present project. And then the last column, I've just had fun picking the number of time where the word evaluation or validation were mentioned in this paper. The first three rows here are for the climate modeling community and in particular two present project focused on volcanic aerosol. 
And you can see that there is a fair number of mention of evaluation and validation. Then the last row is for the eruptive colon model in the comparison project. You can see that uh, the word evaluation is mentioned one in this paper. So it's a bit of a uh, stupid data compilation, but just illustrate a, a really uh, an actual problem, which is that the eruptive colon model uh, community lags behind other community in terms of uh, model evaluation standards. Now, if, if you want to fix this problem, uh, why is it important and um, how do you do that? So before I even go there, I want to highlight that uh, beyond my kind of niche research on climate volcano feedback, volcanic film models are critical to uh, many aspects of physical volcanology because they link the plume height essentially to atmospheric condition and source condition. They are widely used to reconstruct past eruption where we have information on deposits, but no, info, no observation of plume height. During an eruptive crisis, uh, just like the one uh, during La Palma at the moment, we have observation of plume height, but we don't know what the mass flux is. So we use this observation and plume model uh, to then uh, uh, infer the mass eruption rate at the source, and that's then used to initialize dispersion model uh, and issue a, a advisory to aviation. And then these models are also used for planning uh, scenarios for future eruption. Okay, now what sort of data do you need to evaluate this model? Like any model, uh, you need observational data, and uh, you need observational data for both your model input and your model output. And very important, these data need to be independent. And it's actually rarely the case for volcanic eruptions. We only have a handful of eruptions for which we have the mass eruption rate, which is the input, and the plume height, which is the output, independently constrained. And this is a data set from a paper by Larry Mastin in 2014, showing roughly 20 eruptions for which we do have these two parameters. Now, if you look at this plot, showing two parameters, but I kept the entire talk talking about climate and atmospheric condition. The first question is, do we actually have atmospheric condition for all of this eruption? Uh, there are other types of inputs that go into plume models, such as the grain size distribution, which is really important. Uh, you may wonder whether there's an updated version of this data set. We've had a lot of uh, big eruptions since 2014. Where are the uncertainties? Because obviously anything volcanic is going to have uh, a big error bar on it, uh, and who and how the data was collected, and so on. Uh, and if you look at that data set, but also other one, this is a summary of some of their uh, characteristic. <laughs> so first, in terms of number of events, uh, some of them are a really small number of events, which is, of course, not favorable when you want to evaluate a model. Uh, many of these data sets, actually, the eruption source parameter are not strictly independent, which is a problem when you try to uh, evaluate your model output from what you inputted in it. Uh, the atmospheric data are not always there, uh, same for the grain size distribution. Uh, even more surprisingly, only one data set has uncertainties, and only a few of them are online open access databases. So that's what motivates the IVSPAR project, uh, which you can uh, see fulfill all these criteria and also has a large number of events compared to previous database. <laughs> so what is IVSPAR? Uh, first, please don't forget the I. We, this is not a uh, motorbike uh, volcanic project. So IVSPA stands for the Independent Volcanic Eruption Source Parameter Archive, and it's a new data set of eruption source parameter endorsed by IFSA, and we're also supported by the British Geological Survey. Uh, the primary objective is to foster the evaluation and development of eruptive codon models, and in particular to have standard uh, um, evaluation exercise during the modeling to comparison project. Uh, and then this is the current IVSPA working group, uh, which is led by Assam and Taigwell and myself. So just a quick overview of the distribution of events in IVSPA. So you can see we have um, volcanic events from all around the world. The size of the triangle is uh, proportional to how many events were contributed by the volcano. Uh, and I just want to highlight that for specific volcano like Redopt or Etna, we have between 10 and 20 events, which is as many events as some of the previous databases had globally. Uh, so it's really an extensive database. We still miss, have a fairly poor record uh, in particular in the Southeast Asia uh, region where if, if you have any data to contribute from there, we'd be interested to know about it. 
Um, this is an overview of some of the parameters that are available in this database. So each bar show you the fraction of database event for which we have this parameter. So first for all of the event, we have uh, the mass option rate, meaning the uh, mass of tefra fallout and an urgent duration. And we also have at least uh, one value of plume height. But for plume height, we distinguish uh, between the top height, the spreading height, and the sulfur dioxide height. And we also have parameters such as the pyroclastic density current mass um, or the total grain size distribution, TGST, uh, the eruption style, and other parameters that may be relevant to the research. So it's really a wide variety um, of parameters in this database. Uh, and last, I just want to show an example of application uh, of this database to constrain simple scaling relationship between the mass option rate uh, and the plume height above the vent. So each of these triangles is an event in the IBS database. I'm not showing uncertainty just because it would make the graph too busy. Uh, and then these two lines are poor low relationship uh, just fitted on this data. So the dash line here, the pink dash line, is the previous relationship constrained by Mastin et al. 2009. And uh, the fixed blue line is the one we constrain using the new database. And then all these triangles are values top height for the event. But uh, something quite nice with IVSPA is that we also have value for the spreading height, which is now here in pink. And the corresponding individual event are uh, the pink squares. Uh, and then uh, the SO2 height as well, which are uh, orange circles. And not surprisingly, if you look at a fixed mass function rate, uh, the spreading height is lower than the top height, and the SO2 height is somewhere in between. And that's a subtle difference, but still, I think it would be interesting because IBS by users, such as Volcanic Hash Advisory Center, can now use a, a scaling that is adapted to the type of observation they have. So, for example, if you have a, an uh, observation for the spreading height of the umbrella cloud, you would use the pink light to then um, retrieve the mass eruption rate and initialize your dispersion model. Um, okay, some take home message for uh, uh, this model validation part. So first, numerical models used to investigate climate volcano feedbacks are subject to large uncertainties. So going forward, I think it's really important to work in a multimodal framework uh, to investigate climate volcano feedbacks in the future. Uh, the volcanic pre-modeling community lags behind other communities, in particular the climate one, in terms of uh, evaluation standard. And then one way we try to address this is by producing IVSPA, which is a new database of eruption source parameter. And even though we are primarily motivated by uh, pre-model evaluation, uh, I think it has many other applications, and we hope you enjoyed this project. Uh, just to finish, I have a few random announcements. If you don't know about it, there is a relatively new uh, reading group uh, where we particularly welcome early career researchers this year. It's called the Volcanology Reading Rendezvous. And we meet once a month to discuss uh, a paper uh, in the volcanology literature. Uh, so including volcano climate impact or uh, INSA or uh, petrological study, the topic is changing, rotating every month. Uh, and so you have our website here and uh, our Twitter. Uh, so I'm co-convening that um, uh, with seven other uh, early career researchers. And I think it's fair to say Alice Payne was uh, the driving force behind this. And we also have two meeting times, one friendly with more European uh, America's time and one more friendly for uh, Asian, Australian, and uh, New Zealand researchers. And then not directly related, but um, if you are writing your first postdoc proposal or looking for advice and feedback, uh, please feel free to reach out. Second random announcement, I've mostly been using a uh, complex aerosol chemistry climate model to predict volcanic forcing today. Uh, but if you are looking for a very simple model uh, to do that, which you can run in a second with almost no uh, programming experience, then please ask me about EVAH, which is a model doing exactly that. Uh, and then we are hoping to start the next phase of IVSPA development next spring or summer. So if you want to join the working group or if you have uh, data to contribute, please be in touch with myself or something well. Uh, and I just want to say that we are particularly hoping to. Uh, include more early career researcher and researcher from uh, underrepresented minorities in the World Trade King group. Um, if you are interested, again, please reach out. 
And with that, I'm done. And I thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Toma. Um, anybody that has a question, feel free to post it in the chat and we'll be sure to get to it. Um, Sam, do you, do you have any questions that came to mind? I have a few. Um, but yeah, I had, um, I had a couple as well. Um, I had a couple of distractions during that. Sorry if I, you've covered something that I asked. Um, but so from what I saw, the, the model results that you showed were looking at the, um, some examples from tropical eruptions. And I just wondered how the results would change. If you could speak a bit more about how the results might change for looking at eruptions at different latitudes. So for example, maybe a higher latitude eruption. Yeah, yeah. So that's, a, that's an interesting question. I can really only speculate and I'm looking forward to uh, look at that program. So in terms of prime rise, what I can say is that at high latitude, just because there's a lot more wind variability and also stronger wind speed, uh, change in wind speed will be more important than changes in atmospheric stratification to uh, project how high the volcanic plume will be. And also because change in wind speed are uh, more regionally dependent, that may mean that uh, if you look at a volcano in Iceland or Chile or um, Kamchatka, the, the impact on plume height may be much more varied. Uh, and then for the aerosol cycle, I'm actually really not sure um, how, how this will play out. Uh, but if the volcanic eruption already occurs uh, at high latitude, I, the acceleration of the world of sun circulation may not play such a big role in uh, the aerosol lifetime, although I'm really speculating here. So yeah, I don't, think I, I don't think I can tell much more other than I'm looking forward to explore this question. Can I ask a second, not quite related question? Is that okay? Um, and so, so you, in the presentation, you talked about the use of, um, so one of your models is an eruption column model. And so for example, the, the Costa in, uh, into comparison study essentially looks at that for looking at ash plumes, but doesn't, isn't validating against SO2 um, plumes. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about um, the appropriateness for those models for looking at SO2 versus ash plumes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, another uh, line of complexification. So obviously there are many, yeah, many simplifications uh, in my modeling approach, uh, but you are right that this is a question like whether ash and SO2 get separated and that's eruption dependent uh, and these dynamics are relevant for climate volcano feedback. Um, what I can say is that I've been looking at this plume rise uh, climate change interaction in the 3D plume model where ash and SO2 can get separated and uh, the change in SO2 uh, height were consistent uh, with what I've been showing with the 1D plume model. Uh, but obviously when running a big climate model, it's hard to account for all the complex dynamics that can uh, take place during an actual volcanic eruption. I mean, we just inject some SO2 at a prescribed height uh, and location for 24 hour. Uh, whereas an actual eruption, you would of course have a paroxysm phase, winding phase, ash SO2 separation. Also my climate model simulation don't account for the role of ash, which could be, uh, which could modulate this feedback too. So yeah, lo lo lots, of, uh, lots of addition uh, that we could do. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I see there's a question in the chat. I don't know yeah, if you go ahead and if you, you why don't you go ahead and read it off if you want, or actually I'll go ahead and read it off. Uh, so Alice yeah. Kane has asked: Given faster aerosol transport by a, I think a large magnitude eruption uh, to the poles under your future climate change scenario, um, do you think this could affect a sea ice slash glacier melt rates and be larger modes of atmospheric circulation, uh, for example, North Atlantic oscillation? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good question. So on the first one, um, I would have to check um, if the polar temperature response is more intense under the 
prison day type climate or the future climate, which I haven't done. Um, yes, I guess I would expect stronger cooling for the future eruption, both because uh, the global mean energy forcing is higher and it goes faster to the extratropics. Uh, but yeah, I would need to check the regional climate response. And in terms of uh, mode of atmospheric circulation, so in particular for the NAO response, what really matters is uh, the temperature gradient in the stratosphere. Uh, and so what drives this uh, NAO response is the aerosol warming primarily the tropics. And so there is an increased temperature gradient from the tropics to the high latitude. Uh, and so the aerosol spreading faster to high latitude definitely diminish this, uh, uh, this temperature gradient. And I do expect uh, an impact on um, how systematic NAO response are. Uh, I haven't investigated that because uh, I'm using atmosphere only simulation. So the climate model I use the uh, hasn't been coupled to an ocean just because it's uh, we're primarily interested in the forcing. Uh, but when I couple it to an ocean, I will look at a uh, response of the NAO and also the NNO southern oscillation. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Anybody else that has questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, I have a couple that came to mind. Um, so I guess, uh, how, how much um, can these be used as a proxy for like the effect of, if you had it, it, uh, one volcano that follows another, um, is that a similar effect to one, of, one volcano that follows anthropogenic climate change um, or are they, yeah, how are they different? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Those are motivation because in that context, I'm thinking about climate volcano feedback where the driver, the initial uh, driver of this feedback is a change in the climate, but you also have a volcanic eruption and indeed, like you say, have a second one being affected by the first one. Um, and these four things are different in nature, but I would expect some effects to be similar. For example, uh, volcanic eruption do decrease the tropos height uh, slightly uh, because of the tropospheric cooling. Uh, and I think the, also, they also decelerate uh, slightly the world of sun circulation. What I want to highlight is that the two climates now you are look at, um, I compare a historical climate to an upper greenhouse gas concentration trajectory for the future. So on top of my head, the surface temperature difference is five or uh, six degrees Celsius. And that's a huge global mean temperature difference. So to get comparable effect, you really need a huge eruption. Uh, but I think there is recent evidence that there was an, an eruption after, I forgot if it was right after, right before the Toba eruption, and maybe Alice can correct me there. Uh, but that could be interesting, like following a super eruption. Yeah, that, that I think that could potentially affect uh, how uh, the next eruption, uh, how the aerosol and radiative forcing uh, behave. Yeah, I guess there was a mystery eruption in 1810 and what, tam what that might have done to Tambora and you know, fun stuff like that. Um, yeah. Actually, on that sort of similar note, uh, for the IVESPA, um, catalog um how far back do you think you can go with and or what's the trade-off with accuracy and how much you need to know like can you go back to the early 20th century or do they have to all be modeled and well constrained by atmospheric data or okay yeah so good question so they don't all have to be modeled and actually we are uh, avoiding any model derived uh, data but uh, the good thing you point out is atmospheric condition. We do, uh, one of our entry criteria in the database is to have atmospheric condition available. And uh, because climate reanalysis mostly go back to 1900 or 1850, uh, for now we have only considered 20th century and 21st century eruption. The other limitation is uh, for more ancient eruption, it's really hard to get direct plume height observations. Most of the plume height are derived from the deposit, which we do not want because we want independent uh, output and input. So I think you are really limited to 20th century eruption, maybe 19th century, but uh, 
getting from high 10 atmospheric condition become uh, tricky then. Okay, thanks. Uh, that leads Thank into the, my, the, the last question that came to mind, which is um, how do you just sort of define is there how do you define plume height like is there a gradual transition from not a plume to a plume or where do you where do you draw the line yeah uh, well again that's in real life it's a very you know it's hard to draw a line uh you may have, exactly like sam said you may have uh so2 and ash separation you may have multiple intrusion height uh of course it's all time varying uh concretely what i do with the 1d plume model uh, so a 1D plume model can give you the top height of the plume where the momentum is exhausted, and then the neutral buoyancy level where uh, you expect the umbrella cloud to spread. So that's the height I use to say, okay, that's where I inject my volcanic material. Uh, and I don't inject everything at one height. I use a Gaussian distribution that is calibrated against a 3D plume model. Okay. Uh, but yeah, just ignore any potential time variability or complex dynamics. Um, okay, Mike Cassidy has a question. Mo most models show cooling effects lasting less than five years, but what's known about how, what's known about how eruptions that affect other feedbacks, um, for example, 1257 Rinjani, potentially contributing to mini ice ages. What's the role of climate change in perturbing these potential longer feedback cycles? Yeah, uh, that's also a good question. So I guess here there, there are kind of uh, two questions uh, that I see is, would the climate change affect the aerosol cycle the same way for much larger mass of uh, aerosol? Uh, we've run a few uh, simulations for an eruption with 56 teragram of SO2. Uh, so that's, uh, I think that would be tempora like it's still three or four times less than the Samalas uh, region eruption injected. But anyway, and we did see a similar effect, meaning um, smaller aerosol uh, as a consequence of the acceleration of the world of situation. So in terms of forcing, my intuition is that what I've discussed was, would hold, but I would need to do more simulation. And I think what would be really important too is uh, what we refer to as internal climate feedback. So for example, uh, if the background climate is cooler, the ocean stratification uh, would be uh, higher. Sorry, I mean, if the background climate is warmer, the ocean stratification would be stronger. And that would actually amplify the climate response uh, in terms of surface air temperature. Um, and I think there could be similar internal feedback uh, related to um, ice sheet. Um, so not a very precise answer. Uh, and again, my answer is kind of to be explored more. Um, what's really interesting is that this internal climate feedback and aerosol cycle feedback have been investigated uh, separately. So again, that's an area where we need to combine uh, the ideas that different people have come up with and see, see what the net uh, feedback is. Okay. I'm not sure I the answer the question, but no, that's, that's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, yeah, my only my my only comment on like the very giant eruptions is in the EVA H um, tool you see here. If you if you, you should make it so that when you enter like a large enough mass of SO two, the run button changes to run. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that okay, that's a good idea. Just have a G for just run away. Like um, yeah. Okay, I'll I'll end with a just a fun question, I guess. Um, if uh, if the meet if the if the asteroid slash comet that uh, killed the dinosaurs or participated in it happened before the Siberian traps or the sorry the I think it's the Deccan traps, uh, would that have made their effect worse or better? Do you think? Okay, so. I think here I really can't comment. Uh, kind of wide <laughs> speculation, but I guess the, the type of eruption and the magnitude and the time scale is just so different that um, yeah, it would be a bit hard. And I don't have uh, meteoric climate impact in this simulation. Uh, 
So I'm, I'm really going to call it um, no worries. Yeah, be, beyond my current level of expertise and knowledge, uh, but it is an interesting question. It's also one of our motivation to explore lucky type version uh, with longer injection time scale and lots of aerosol, but um, closer to the tropopause to see if feedback de behave differently then. Uh, but yeah, I guess we could consider um, LIP type uh, scenario too. <laughs> Yeah, F fun question, but content are really cool. Uh, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, okay, well, if anybody has any uh, further questions for Toma, uh, feel free to, um, I guess you can reach out to him uh, via the addresses here um, or post, well, we're gonna post the recording of this on YouTube in a few days, so you can comment on that um, and we'll get those questions answered. Um, and, yeah, I think in the meantime, uh, we can wrap it up if that's okay with you guys. And um, I just want to thank uh, Tomas so much for a really fascinating talk. He gave me a lot of things to think about. And Sam, thank you so much for making uh, for this the uh, making this opportunity possible and for providing the introduction. Um, I look forward to working with both of you guys in the future. Thank you all for attending and thanks Chris and Sam and kudos to you Chris because it's 3 a.m. now so oh, that's all right yeah thanks so much for organizing no problem thank you so much guys thank you